I wanted to ask you if one is borderline diabetic and with a high LDL, what is the danger if I've been prescribed a statin or if one is prescribed a statin, a Crestor specifically? Um, well, I mean, when a, when a statin is indicated, um, and there's some, you know, various ways that we can assess that. But if a statin is indicated, then the benefits far outweigh the risk. There was, I believe, I believe it was a subgroup analysis of the Jupiter study. There is some suggestion that for people who are um, uh, insulin resistant or borderline diabetic, that statins may increase uh, diabetes. Um, but in that study, the subjects who were on the path toward being diabetic already, I believe became diabetic 31 days earlier than they would have otherwise. Um, but yet they still had incremental benefit on average, some didn't. Um, and on average, they uh, still did better. So when it's indicated, we use it in diabetics, we use it in pre-diabetics all the time. Um, it can be an incredibly helpful medication. Uh, if you read the internet, statins are the worst thing in the history of time. Uh, there's really a lot of the better study than aspirin. There's data in millions of subjects about it. And obviously there's side effects with any kind of medication, but for someone who is indicated in the benefits uh, far outweigh the risk. And so um, I can't say specifically for you, uh, that, um, you know, what, what to do, but in general, we do use it frequently with high LDL and someone who is insulin resistant separately. There is a study called DPP diabetes prevention program that was published in like 2000, I think in New England journal of medicine. And that looked at insulin resistant patients and they randomized them to control healthy lifestyle or metformin and metformin lowered incident diabetes, um, more than control, but the healthier lifestyle, which was like exercise, I forgot the details of it, um, but included exercise, lowered the incident diabetes even more. So really, as you know, un uh, underpins the importance of a healthy lifestyle. Thanks very, very much for that, doctor. And up next, we're gonna bring in Max. Welcome, Max. Hi. Uh Doctor, you, you recommended omega-3 as a supplement. Can you please be more specific what type of omega-3 you will recommend to vegans? Um, I really can't uh, because I don't know of any great studies looking at it. Um, and it's kind of an empiric recommendation. There are algae oil-based um, uh, omega-3 supplements that some of my vegan patients will get. Um, but that's about you know, that they're, they're findable online, but there's not a particular brand that I endorse or know, know well. So sorry about that. Thanks very much for that, doctor. And now we're going to go to somebody with the initial CG. Welcome, CG. Oh, let me try that again. There you go. Hi. Um, yes, doctor. Do you know why Dr. Esselstyn um, recommends cooking the leafy greens to get the um, nitric oxide. I mean, he says to cook them for six minutes and it seems like you're cooking them to death and all the vitamins and minerals are going to end up in the water. Is eating raw leafy greens not as beneficial? Um, well, I mean, Dr. Esselstyn has incredible experience with his patients. They've done exceptionally well. And I do think he, I think there's a, I think there's a little bit of data that that he has about how um, cooking them can help potentially and putting a little vinegar on them can augment their improvement on um, endothelial function. What I, what I recommend patients do honestly is to try to mix it up uh, because some fruits and vegetables, some vegetables you cook, certain nutrients come out, some you don't cook, other nutrients come out. Uh, so I, I encourage people to mix it up and um, I, so I, I don't know beyond that. I think that he has a little bit of data that it can improve nitric oxide, um, uh, function or, or uh, manufacturing within the endothelial cell. That's the best I've got on that, but I do like patients to mix it up and it is oftentimes very hard 
for people to have green leafy vegetables six times a day in that context. And some people can, they have wonderful improvements, but that, that is a challenge for some of my patients. Thanks, doctor. And up next, we're going to bring in Steve. Welcome, Steve. A lot of Steves, me? Yeah, you're the one. Thank you. Hi, thanks, Ben. Uh, hi, doctor. Wonderful uh, schmooze. Thank you so much. Um, doctor Kim Williams just dropped a bomb on us about not supplementing with B12 if you're an ex-smoker. Ah, help us navigate this one. Just stop taking the B12 and not worry about it because we get something in the stuff that's added to the food. And what do we do? I don't know. I don't know that data. Um, what was his issue with it? That uh, an ex, uh, sort of like the beta carotene study ba way back in the day, that if yeah. you're an ex smoker, uh, it's going to you know, feed the aggressive lung cancer. Yeah, so um, I, I know the study you're, you're talking about. I'm just not too familiar with the data of B12 and ex-smokers increasing lung cancer. It may vary well, but given that I'm not sure exactly what study he's talking about, I have, I'm just going to have to defer on that. I'm going to have to look it up myself. So, sorry. No, we really appreciate that, doctor. Thank you. And um, I'm going to ask Lois to unmute yourself, if you can, Lois. See if that there we go. Hi, Lois. Hi, hello. Um, I have a question about um, whether it, what you recommend for your patients who can't take statins and have atherosclerosis, and maybe um, I'm speaking for myself. My cardiologist would like my numbers to be a little bit lower. Um, do you have any recommendations for that? Yeah, there's and also I'm so sorry, Lois, we accidentally muted you before you, if you could just unmute yourself one more time. Let's see if, oh, there we go. Hi, I'm sorry yeah. about that, Lois. And, uh, hi, and I forgot my second question. So <laughs> if, if you could just address the question on statins. Sure. So <clears throat> a few things, there's lots of ways that we can lower cholesterol beyond statin. Um, now, sometimes with statins, there's different things we can try. Some people can tolerate it once a week. We can change the dose. We could change the type of statin. There's all sorts of little tricks people will have up our sleeve to adjust that. But assuming someone can't take statin at all or it needs, the LDL needs to be lowered on top of the statin, of course, we recommend lifestyle change. But from a medicinal standpoint, there's a medication called Zetia that a lot of people will use. It blocks cholesterol absorption and it can lower it 15 to 20% more. That works very well, uh, usually very well tolerated completely different mechanism of action as a statin compared to statin. And, and then of course, there's the newer PCSK9 inhibitors, the injectable one every other week, which work incredibly well, very well tolerated, can lower LDL tremendously. Um, so that's another uh, terrific option as well. Um, they, the, the issue with, with those is that they tend to be fairly expensive right now, and it can be a bit of a hurdle to get them covered. Uh, but those, those are the lifestyle, Zetia, the PCSK9 inhibitors would be, you know, the three, us the three usual things we'd initially work with. Thanks very, very much for that. And now I'm going to ask somebody with the initials of VT to go ahead and unmute. Hi, welcome. Hi, um, uh, Dr. Also, um, I have a question regarding um, if your cholesterol is like over 200, but your ratio is good, um, is that something to worry about? Um, well, uh, in just speaking generally, I'm not sure which ratio you mean. Um, I think actually, because I'm asking for a friend and I know that she has like over 200, um, uh, cholesterol. And I think the, well, whatever the ratio that, um, one, the, the, I guess the good one I'm, is high. I'm guessing you're the, it's the total cholesterol over HDL cholesterol is probably mm -hmm. what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, the devil's of course, in the details, we're learning much more that HDL is falling off of its pedestal and maybe more of a marker than anything else. Um, 
And Mendelian randomization trials are showing that, which is kind of a genetic randomized trial, showing that higher HDL levels may not be helpful. Um, so uh, the devil is in the details and her, her cardiologist could calculate her 10 year risk score um, that um, uh, to, to assess her 10 year risk of having a cardiovascular event. And that would include a, a variety of lipid metrics and can help guide decisions on whether to start a statin in a guideline based way. Uh, so it doesn't mean she's off the hook. It doesn't mean she's on the hook, uh, but it means that a little bit more assessment needs to be done. Okay, thank you. Thanks, doctor. And um, let me go ahead and bring in Nancy. Uh, Nancy, go right ahead. Oh, hi, thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Oswald, I just have the two questions. Uh, would you suggest or recommend a patient that's on a statin to take the uh, Q10 as well, because there have been some debates whether to take a Q10 or not. And the second one is, um, since uh, Mount, you mentioned Mount Fiori um, offers the wellness nutrition program, I mean, how does one get enrolled in it, if yeah, so, need be? So thank you. In terms of the coenzyme Q10, I do not recommend that patients routinely take it. Uh, the only time that I'll use it is when someone is having a lot of muscle aches on a statin. There's some evidence that it might be helpful, some evidence that it's not. There's actually interesting end of one randomized trials that suggest some of the muscle aches may not, may not actually be real. Um, but be that as it may, uh, I, I don't use, use it routinely. Um, if someone wants to use it, I don't think it's a big deal. Um, but I will sometimes try it when someone has muscle aches on a statin to see if we can get them to tolerate the statin. In terms of the program, we did used to have periodic Saturday morning sessions modeled after Dr. Esselstyn's where uh, I would speak and RD would speak, Lauren Graff, we would serve lunch. Um, we weren't charge, we didn't charge patients for it. I funded it all through donations. Uh, we were doing those like maybe every other month, sometimes more for like 10 years, but then COVID hit. And I've been forced to, or well, I have to stop those. I can't do them now. So what our program currently is, and from an outpatient perspective, is patients come and see me. Uh, you know, they'll have some sort of cardiovascular diagnosis because I'm a cardiologist. Um, and they'll come and see me in the office and we'll weave plant-based nutrition into their care and we'll follow up with them along those lines. I've hand out some things and I'll give patients. And if someone is interested, they can call... Um, 718-920-5197, 718-920-5197, and they can get set up with a new patient appointment to see me. Thanks very much for that. Uh, we have Rebecca back. Hi, Rebecca. Hi. Do you have an opinion on mammography screenings for a woman who's in her 40s, whole food plant-based, generally healthy, and no family history of breast cancer? I do not. It's not my area. I would follow the, my recommendation would be to follow the guidelines, um, but it is not, as a cardiologist, I, I do not do, I do not order a mammography. Got it. Thank you very much for that as well. And um, I have a feeling that Lois remembered her second question. Lois, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Hi, Lois. Hi, I did remember it. Thank you. I was wondering what you consider a low-fat, whole foods, plant diet. Uh, doctors always talk about low-fat. Is that 10%, 15%, 20, what, what's the range that you usually <laughs> recommend? And I'm asking because I'm small, so my calorie intake isn't huge. So if I eat any extra flaxseed, chia seeds, nuts, the fat or soy, the fat goes way up. Well, I think the percentage of fat. I think for a low fat, it typically falls in the 10 to 15% range. Um, but, you know, there, it's, uh, people don't necessarily have to go so low fat. 
Um, there are there are healthy fats that people can have as part of nuts and avocados and other things. Um, so, but that would be a, you know a more specific conversation with one's physician. Um, but typically, a low, truly low fat would be 10, 15 percent. When they call them low fat in studies, they'll say less than 30 percent. But that's not.